Hello, Prof. Storm and TAs. My name is Xi Chen Xu, and the topic of my podcast is death penalties for murder. As one of the oldest penalties in the human history, the death penalty still remains significant today in discussions of the justice system and curbing crime rates. While the debate regarding the abolishment of death sentencing still carries on, around 170 countries globally have already abolished or introduced a moratorium on the death penalty. This podcast will focus on answering the research question of whether the death penalty is the best punishment for murder. Through the evaluation of the death penalty's effectiveness in deterring murder rates, relieving victim families' trauma, and promoting social justice, this podcast argues that death penalty is not the best punishment for murder. The case used by this podcast is the famous Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. For the first point, the death penalty cannot effectively deter murder. According to Anderson, among the various claims supporting death sentencing as a punitive response to murder, one of the most offered rationales is that death penalty will deter people who might otherwise commit murder. However, the claims that death penalty can deter murder lack factual evidence. It can be rebutted from a macro and a micro level. On a macro level, the murder rate of the U.S. states. With and without death penalties can be analyzed. If death penalty can effectively deter murder, they should be viewed as a variable holding a negative causation with the increase in the murder rate. That is, states with the death penalty should have fewer increase and more decrease in the murder rate compared to states without the death penalty. In fact, according to the Uniform Crime Report by the FBI from 1995 to 1999. States without the death penalty had a 45 percent lower average homicide rate than the states with death penalty. It is also worth noting that when both states and national homicide rate were steadily decreasing in 1995 to 1998, one of the most active death penalty counties, Marion County, had a 20 percent increase in its homicide rate. Macro-level homicide rate data indicates weak to no correlation between the death penalty and the murder rate, further refuting the claim that death penalty deter murder. On a micro level, criminological studies focusing on individual motives of murder can be investigated to understand the degree of death penalty deterrence to individuals. Claims that death penalty deter murder rates are generally constructed based on a hypothesis, that is. The fear of the death penalty poses a mental pressure for individuals who might otherwise commit murder to give up on that thought. Katz's righteous slaughter theory suggests that perpetrators are often motivated to kill by the intense sense of humiliation and anger that comes from perceiving that their basic value have been challenged by the victim. Under such scenario, the offense arises spontaneously, and the perpetrator is not deterred by severe punishment. The righteous slaughter concept proposed by Katz reveals motivations for the murder of passion. In the process of killing, the perpetrator was driven by ire and failed to consider or be stopped by the possible death penalty. Statistic-wise, it is worth noting that according to the Uniform Crime Report of FBI, 53% of murder victims are killed by someone they knew, and among that, 41.8% were murdered during arguments. The data from the UCR provides a factual foundation for the righteous slaughter theory, in which arguments usually involve strong anger and humiliation. Combining Katz's motive analysis and the statistics, the widely ineffective attribute of death penalty deterrence is further disclosed. To summarize this argument, at a macro level, the analysis of homicide rate in U.S. states with and without the death penalty. Shows no or even opposite correlation between the death penalty and the homicide rate. On a mi- micro level, many murders are motivated by righteous slaughter, in heated arguments that the perpetrator would not be deterred by death penalty. In both levels, evidence suggests that the constructed deterring function of the death penalty is invalid. Besides that, 
the death penalty cannot effectively relieve the trauma of the victim's family. Among the arguments supporting death penalty, a common one is that by the execution of the death penalty on the murder, it will bring a sense of justice to the victim's family, therefore relieving or healing their mental trauma. In a tweet from the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster, he mentioned by restoring the death penalty, people can be one step closer to providing victims, family, and the loved one with justice and closure they are owed by law. In his tweet, McMaster constructed a correlation between the death penalty and providing justice and closure for the co-victims. It further emphasized the retaliation attribute of the death penalty and links it to justice. However, the sense of revenge brought about by death penalty cannot bring mental relief to the co-victims. Opposingly, the death penalty might lead to a sense of re-victimization and additional mental harm. According to Psychology Today, researchers found a strong ambivalence in co-victims' action towards capital punishment, in which only 2.5 achieved true closure, and 20.1 said that the execution did not help their heal. The data indicates that the trauma experienced by whole victims varies and it is problematic to assume an eye for an eye retaliation to be the only method of healing the mental trauma. The case will be introduced here to provide some insights regarding the possible mental journeys of co-victims. The Oklahoma City bombing was considered one of the most severe terrorist attacks in the U.S. before 9-1-1. On April the 19th, 1995, Alfred P. Moray Federal Building experienced a truck bombing, leading to 168 deaths and 680 injuries. The perpetrator of this attack, ex-army soldier McVeigh and Nichols, was soon arrested. According to McVeigh, the motives of this attack was to express his anger towards the federal government for its confrontation with branch Davidians. Given that McVeigh has a strong interest in survivalism, the attack had aroused society's attention and reflection, especially the psycholog psychological trauma by the co victims. But Welch, a co victim who lost his 23 year old daughter in the attack, has described that At first, I was in absolute pain. All I wanted was to see those people fright. Looking back, I call that the temporary insanity period. I know that death penalty wasn't going to bring her back, and I realized that it was about revenge and hate. And the reason Julie, which is his daughter, and 167 others were dead was because of the very same thing, revenge and hate. It was McVeigh and Nichols' hate against the federal government. They would never have performed that act if they hadn't felt justified that they were doing the right thing for their cause just like we think we're doing the right thing for our cause when we execute prisoners. Walsh's quote proposed a possible explanation for the numerical data stated by Mueller. That is, many co-victims eventually recognized the hate attribute in the death penalty, linking it more to the same hatred motives that killed their beloved ones, rather than a sense of trauma closure. In this case, the death penalty could bring additional harm to the victim's family when they realize they are doing a similar thing to the perpetrator out of a similar cause. Besides the co-victims, it is also worth noting the additional trauma and hatred experienced by the perpetrator's family witnessing the death penalty. To summarize this argument, the research statistics in Mueller's article and but Welch's quote collaboratively suggests that death penalty fails to bring mental relief to the co-victims. Opposingly, it repeatedly strengthened the hatred of the an eye for an eye retaliation logic. This challenges the rationales that the death penalty can provide justice for victims' families. Lastly, the death penalty cannot embody social justice and fairness. When sentencing and punitive responses are suggested for a convicted crime, it is worth reflecting on the principle of legal sentencing. More explicitly, what is the purpose of the sentencing? What issue is the sentencing addressing and what message justice system wishes to express? The study by Warren Stafford in 1984 
found the principle of just desserts to be the most crucial sentencing focus among members of the public. It was endorsed by 42% of their respondents. Through the statistics, it is clearly that a major aim of sentencing is to embody justice and fairness by sentencing all of the convicted what they deserve. However, the current death penalty provides irreparable results for a considerable amount of racially biased sentencing in the United States. This serving as an extension of social injustice rather than justice. Research by the Associated Press in Chittahochee Circuit shows that the persecutors thought the death penalty 38.7% of the time when the defendant was black and the victim white. 32.4% when both were white. 5.9% when both were black and never when defendant was white and victim black. The data further indicates the existence of systematic racism in this justice system of the United States. Additionally, the unique feature of the death penalty should be taken into consideration. Unlike other sentencing which can be retrialed and resentenced, the result of a death penalty can be, cannot be modified. By comparing War and Stafford study and the statistics in the Associated Press research, a contrast between the public's ideal principle of sentencing and the actual function of death sentencing can be observed. Through research on the landscape of capital punishment in North Carolina, a Center for Death Penalty Litigation staff commented that the death penalty continues to achieve exactly what it was intended to do when it began, punish the powerless and cement the supremacy of the powerful. It remains the ultimate symbol of state control. The quote from CTPL staff corroborates the Associated Press data. It is also worth noting that AP's data comes from the research in Georgia, whereas the CDPL staff's comments are regarding North Carolina's death penalty landscape, which substantively reveals the universality of the inequality related to death penalty. To encapsulate this argument, the data from AP's research and CPTL's staff and quotes shows that the death penalty fails to embody the justice and fairness purpose of sentencing. The topic of the death penalty towards murder poses great significance in our understanding of crimes and deviance, also causing reflection on the purpose towards it. Although just as Anderson textbook stated that the definition of murder varies with different contexts, it is worth noting the overwhelmingly popular norms and impression that views murder as both a unarguable crime and deviance. While on another hand, death penalty, despite scale and forms, is about the most severe punitive response. The notability of murder and the preference towards the death penalty collaboratively reveals a deep-rooted and seemingly unquestionable concept that was constructed from a strong desire of homomorphic revenge in human evolutions. Interestingly, as I'm sharing the topic of my podcast with my family, as I'm yet to share my answer towards the research questions, the natural stance of all five of my family members were surprisingly strong pro-death penalty. Although it is clear that the specific cultural context and social location of my family members played an essential role in their answers, their answers still reflect a considerably popular voice in the society. Therefore, this podcast wishes to challenge some of the rationales proposed by the deep-rooted concept that supports the death penalty. As for personal learning and surprises, I have learned about Kate's theory on irrational motives of crimes. Through self-reflection on actions and mentality under strong anger, I have found surprisingly that many of the deterrent factor in my rational state can be unconsciously ignored as I'm driving by ire and a sense of humiliation. I was also shocked with the degree of racial bias in the death penalty sentencing in the US through both the study from the DPIC and the Associated Press. To conclude, this podcast addressed on the question of whether death penalty is the best punitive response towards murder. Through the analysis of its ineffectiveness in deterring murder, bringing relief to the co-victims, and embodying social justice, this podcast argued that death penalty is not the best punitive response towards murder.